only way that's going to be really bad is if I was really to do it. Like Brian at the spot, and we're awake now. That's good. But we have to move on, and I think we'll have a chance to revisit the same questions a little bit later. We're going to move on to the uh, numerical part of the problem, aspects of the problem. The next speaker is going to be Louis Moresi of Melbourne University, telling us about the Quagmire algorithm and the parallel landscape evolution models for coupling to large scale tectonics. Thank you, Tosin. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm going to take a uh, well, I'll take the, the make the obvious statement that uh, if you're a geodynamicist, you probably think I moved out of geodynamics a while ago into the landscape evolution, but I realize I haven't moved into that either. <clears throat> so I'm not quite sure where I fit in any of the communities, but I have followed, uh, or I have been following a lot of the uh, of the discussion about trying to make. Uh, trying to make uh, large-scale tectonic models interact with some form of uh, surface process algorithms. Okay. Um, so what's the, the inspiration for the sorts of things that I, I became interested in or uh, think about are questions on a very, very large scale, I think. And... Um, um, those those uh, questions relate to sort of uh, the, the long term tectonic evolution of, of the Earth as a whole, the sort of plate scale processes, and thinking about what um, the, the surface is telling us about the evolution of the topography. And it's telling us a couple of things. Obviously, most of most of what we heard about is is topography that that uh, sort of raises and, and lowers as its primary uh, primary direction, if you like, and, and that we can sort of describe everything as a, you know, in terms of the latitude and longitude and, and the vertical direction that we can put down. But it's also worth, you know, if you look at it, I, I made this map with this particular piece of study to say, well, if you look at, if you look at what's happening in um, you know, uh, some typical piece of topography around the world, you can say, uh, well, there are places where everything is more or less in equilibrium in, in, the, in the sense of things flowing downhill and very broad sense of things flowing downhill. And there are, there are other places where things take very tortuous routes to get where they're going. And obviously, this is what we're seeing about the, about the tectonic history. Um, from a tectonic modeling point of view, these, these sorts of continental collisions have been sort of bread and butter of many... Um, Many modeling groups over the years, and trying to understand how subduction and plate motion interact with continental um, the, the continental uh, with these continental strain rates and so forth. This is, I mean, this has clearly been one of the things that we've been done for the past forty or fifty years uh, you know, endlessly revisiting this problem. Um, and so we we can build quite sophisticated models in which we understand how the um, how these how these collisional processes happen, what happens to the um, what happens to the overlying continental crust, and the question is, what more can we bring to that if we if we achieve some better understanding of what the surface flows are doing and the information that they're carrying to us about this particular process? Um, so here is the here is a movie of sort of a typical collisional experiment that we would do in sort of the tectonic modeling world of, of some um, the, the subduction zone evolving, plates moving, plates are mostly here moving laterally. And, and, and as they, and in this case, we have a, a, an indenter going into the continental um, block here, which is creating an enormous amount of lateral movement. And as a consequence, there's is uh, vertical motion, but it seems to me that one of the one of the things that is really important to try to be able to do is to build, coupled with codes like that, is to, is to sort of not necessarily assume that the motions are, are, are interesting, they can be up and down, and 
parameterize everything in that way. And that's the starting point that I took when I started to think about ways to solve this problem. Um, so in a way, there are these sort of two different things that we're always trying to look at as we, as we kind of um, approach these problems. And, and I guess I, I, uh, I just sort of introduce what I think of as, as, the, as the kinds of models that I hear a lot about, actually, which is uh, trying to match patterns of, in this case, um, some rifting models. This is Ramon Boucher's work. And, um, and he used uh, our underworld code for doing lithospheric deformation and coupled that with the Badlands code that comes out of the Sydney University group. And the, the idea there is, is really trying to forward model stratigraphy. In this case, it's a, it's a large scale project that's interested in, in understanding basin fill and how the hinterland contributes to that. Right? So it's a very nice work on that, but it's not obvious to me that the same techniques that are used to study those detailed processes will be the ones that we might look at if we were very interested in that original, very large tectonic length and time scales. And we might want to go back to some more generic type models, very simple, stripped back kind of models and just really understand what's going on. But on the other hand, we might want to consider, if we're starting again in terms of how we think about the problem, what's the best way to build algorithms that can sit nicely with the kinds of codes that I'm talking about um, uh, in the you know, in, in large scale tectonics, which have you know, very large deformations in both the horizontal direction and vertical vari you know, in vertical movement and uh, <clears throat> in terms of tectonic erosion of topography by sort of folding and buckling and, and uh, stretching and all kinds of other processes. Um, so from the point of view of, of how you build algorithms like that, the idea was to try to come up with some way to look at, you know, to build a sort of a flexible approach. It doesn't really, it's not really dependent on running with one particular code or in particular running with um, one particular set of equations or one particular problem in mind. So, so of course I, I started thinking about that and it's taken forever to make much progress. Um, so it is interesting to look at, to think about um, some of the aspects of this problem and, and some of the reasons that the problem can be a bit hard to solve in general. Um, and uh, so you know, one of them that is of course has come up many times is that there is some form Let's be abstract about it. There's some form of downstream sort of aggregation across a whole large lateral extent of the, of the system. There is this accumulation of you know, perhaps it, perhaps it would be you know, water flow in rivers, but it could be ice. It could be any of these things where where there is an accumulation, and you don't you know the, the more more uh, accumulation you have, the more uh, potential you have to um, greater time dependence. So in this case, from this little uh, kids experiment, you can do, um, you can go and play with this thing in Houston, and uh, and if you if you connect sufficient numbers of the uh, of these little pathways together, you can drive a little water wheel here, uh, <coughs> some sort of exciting fast rate that causes everyone to get splashed. And so that's kind of the principle of the operation. It doesn't really need to be much more complicated to develop the computational side of that problem. Um, you know, it's very well behaved, and you can you can look at these. The, you can develop that pathway as a as a tree, as a sort of a, as, a, as a graph, which has some very nice properties. So it's not cyclic. Um, everything is aggregating. Paths paths can be very much independent of one another. And that's really that's really quite a nice property, and it's exploited extensively in making efficient algorithms. Um, and we can use this kind of, oh, this characteristic is, is, the, is the part, the sort of the area term that appears in, in most of these sort of stream power formulations. And, and no matter how you vary those, it's always important to be able to look at some of these upstream type processes where aggregation is occurring. Um, from the point of view of, uh, from, the, from the point of view of, the other side of this tectonic problem at a large scale, I thought I would just mention you know, Australia sort of, and tectonics aren't really the sort of things you think about together, at least not at the present day. But, um, but that's not really the case, right? It's just very slow and very subtle. 
Um, and so in a very flat landscape, and one in which there's very little of anything going on, no, not really, uh, not very much flow and not very much erosion, then it's might maybe possible to record a lot more subtle signals, right? Then you can record, uh, or then, then thinking about the very, very large scale um, variations in the, um, in the tectonic environments that, that happen in collision zones, for example. So just a few meters shift in, in topography on the very, very longest wavelength can completely alter the system. And the fact that, that nothing gets, nothing, you know, that, that is then recorded for, for a very long period of time. So there's actually a possibility here that you can start to see through the, see through this system into the deep lithosphere and the, the potentially the um, instabilities that occur below the lithosphere that are very subtle and you don't normally see. So there's a sort of, again, it's a very long wavelength, very large scale process that we're interested in trying to understand. Um, but it's almost the exact opposite of the of what I just talked about. Um, and there are quite some modeling challenges in, in uh, this example, including the fact that um, it doesn't look anything like the, the graph that I just drew. So many of the river systems in Australia don't really go anywhere. They sort of, they just sort of go into dust, right? I mean, look, this one's backwards. So it comes out of here and then just. I don't know. And, and actually, it turns out that, well, I should say that later. Cool. Um, so the characteristics of the problem, I don't think I really need this slide from the point of view of explaining anything, but just really to point out that uh, if you think about the way that the, um, the, the there, are, there are two sort of sets of processes, one, one a local, one those which involve having to be able to do this aggregation. And they really need to be treated differently, and, in, and of course, they always are treated differently. Um, but very much from the sort of development of a parallel algorithm that can couple with other codes, it'd be nice to be able to treat those in a way that is sort of not particularly special. You don't have to develop some something that is not compatible with other kinds of um, other kinds of uh, with, with codes that are built in this way. Um, and in particular, one of the things that many of the tectonics codes do is that they're just very much parallel and distributed, uh, distributed across many, many cores of large-scale computer, computers. And um, under those circumstances, um, you know, we normally have a pretty standard approach to solving that problem. We just take the equations, render everything into a bunch of matrices, and find suitable solvers for each chunk of the problem. And Put it all together in a way that gives us a, a finer solution. Um, and that process of going through the decomposition um, is sort of, I don't know, the work of that is put onto the uh, matrix, your algebra library. And so, um, so we normally sort of forget about that. But if you look at this sort of pathological example of taking uh, a model in which information is being aggregated, then Tells you some of the hard parts of doing this, right? Which is that um, if you start, so I, I just pointed out the flow of information here, and I numbered these little boxes, sort of representing representing how you distributed this domain across a bunch of processes. And uh, somehow or other, I think I shifted that a bit so the yeah, yeah, the, the ones that don't get numbered. But anyway, the information sort of starts out up here, moves around. We're just deleting, subtract this information as we go around, and as you can see, um, this is this is cyclic in the sense that the information is passing from one place to the next, and algorithms which are actually explicitly worrying about the passage of information from place to place actually have to worry about, you know, have I finished this one? Can I carry on? So, so there is this dependency which is non-trivial, and although, as I pointed out, this is a contrived example, um, it's also not. Completely, um, the problem itself is not irrelevant. If you actually build an algorithm um, that is based on detecting whether or not you, are, you have completed something before moving on to the next process, and then that cyclic dependency is a disaster. So it becomes much, much more hard work. So, uh, I, I, so, so the, the, this bugged me for quite some time, and, uh, and then I decided to have a bit of a think about this, and I realized that the answer was to go back to the simple things, 
which is to think about stuff in terms of, um, so see if we could do the same thing. Render all of our equations as matrix form and then not have to worry anymore, you know, give all the work over to the linear algebra, linear algebra packages which are designed for dealing with matrices in parallel and dispersed form. Okay. And it turns out, of course, that there is a way to do that, as everyone already knew, except me, apparently, but uh, that you just render everything that in any graph you can draw you can render in this um, um, matrix that tells you how information is passed along the graph. Um, so these simple directed graphs which have very simple structure to them um, actually lend themselves naturally to this process. And you can you can look and see how it works that if you have a whole bunch of information, A, B, C, D, E, F, you've got these different nodes, then you have some arrows which essentially reproduce the uh, the passageways and the toy problems, um, then a simple matrix multiplication will give you, let's say, this matrix times uh, <clears throat> the original nodes um, produces this distribution of information on the nodes. In other words, we've taken uh, A and B and put them together at C, and we've taken E and moved it to D, and all that kind of thing. So that's one um, sort of iteration, if you like, of moving information across surface. Uh, I'm just going to move that by hand. So you can see that if you keep cycling through this, you will propagate information from one, wherever it is on, wherever it is on the uh, domain, out towards the uh, surface. Um, so we can think of that as a, as a matrix. So it is a matrix. We can think of matrix Z as something which is an operator to move information from one node in a downhill. I'd say downhill, I mean, if you look at this, one, one node across uh, the graph and the square D, then it moves information from there two times. Um, and D itself is incredibly sparse. It's more sparse than the identity matrix. It seems to fall off the edge. Um, and the total, the total operation that we're trying to do is all of those. So we're trying to move things one, then we're trying to move them again, then we're trying to move them again. And we actually would like to accumulate, so we can think of each of those. Um, that's not a sparse matrix at all. Um, you have to do that n times, that n is the longest length of the chain. Um, but if we if we were to do that, then well, parallelism is quite straightforward because we just build a matrix and we we use the parallel matrix uh, library to solve the problem. Um, the actual implementation you would probably not do by building that matrix and doing a lot of matrix multiplications because there's a recursion that exists. If you keep multiplying and, and summing this problem um, over and over again, then you will achieve the result. If you do it n times, you will achieve the result of, uh, of building the matrix and using it once. So it becomes a very effective approach. Um, okay. uh, so they are equivalents. The two representations are formally the same and they look the same. Look the same as identity they may not be the same. Uh, domain decomposition is in principle pretty straightforward and you can you can sort of convince yourself that as long as you have uh, some overlap of the two domains in which the, the uh, structure of the uh, in this case triangulation so the structure of the the, the neighbor relationship between the points would be uh, reproduced then um, you can guarantee that you can actually build all of these matrices piece by piece without having to construct the whole, without having to construct the whole triangulation of the whole domain. So in principle, this is not a, this problem lends itself to parallelism. And here's an example of, of doing something like that. I, I, I can show you how to do this one. But essentially, this is, a, this is Australia, um, as sort of. I mean, there's some bits and pieces here and there. But I, I took this, so I took, I took the uh, Itopo one uh, topography model. I did that because it's it's uh, relative to geoid, so it, at least as a starting point, it should it should be uh, straightforward and and just look, you know, just a million or ten million points or something, just a triangulation, and then these uh, domains here are the whatever whatever um, uh, just let Petsy in fact do some decomposition and then just showed how the flow paths. 
can be calculated. And so these, these here are just pathways, not actual rivers, they're flow pathways, if you like, across the landscape. And they flow naturally across the boundaries. There's no special, boundaries are not special. Um, so we, if we can do that, there are some actual, there's some nice things that happen. So, for example, if we want to go backwards, if we want to start at the outflow points and propagate information upstream, then we just use the transpose of that original Z matrix. Um, and that's not a one-to-one -one mapping anymore, but that's what you want, right? You want to take each one and use it for every neighbor that it has. Um, and so that's a trivial operation. You can find the transpose of the matrix immediately, and you can multiply it out using exactly the same routines that I just talked about. You might not want to do a summation, but you might well want to uh, transfer information using that. Um, so that's a, that's, I'll show you what you can do with that. Uh, the second thing you can, another thing you can do very easily is that uh, multiple pathways for flow are, are trivial to accommodate because we can build sort of a downhill flow matrix that goes to one neighboring node or two, just, and then you can do one to a second neighboring node and we just add them together with some weighting function, which is a diagonal, a diagonal matrix. And, and um, W here can be whatever you want it to be, actually. It could be based on slope, it could be based on, um, it could be a delta function if you want to, you know, if, you, if you want to do things differently, you can, however you want to do it. That's kind of the, you know, because, because I've learned very much that whoever is in the audience today will probably want to do it differently to the person next to them. Um, so people who th worry about, uh, sorry, it's people who worry about um, matrix parallel kind of um, worry about doing this efficiently will worry that D1 and D2 are quite sparse. Um, oh, so I should I should point out these ones these ones are both sparse. Of course, together they're a bit less sparse. But this matrix here is now equivalent to the one I was using before. If you want to go back uphill, you can use multiple paths. If, be able to do it, then you just do the transpose of this one. And again, you can do, you, you have this concept of, of multiple, actually by the time you, by the time you take these ones with multiple pathways and you know, take, take the full matrix, then it, it's in, it becomes pretty dense. Um, um, the, pur the purpose of doing, well, one of the purposes of doing that there are, there are two, you know, two purposes I can think of. One of, them, one of them is to sort of actually physically represent the fact that multiple pathways can be very useful in a low release setting. The other reason it might be interesting is to look at this, which is, which is uh, this is what happens if you build a matrix out of the first downhill neighbor direction on a perfectly smooth, well, this part of the surface is perfectly smooth, at least numerically, it's defined by cylindrically symmetric functions. Um, and then these, these points here, well, I'll show you them. Sort of cor uh, well, cornulated, corrugated at the, at the ends here to just kind of have some outflow channels which will catch each peak. And the interesting thing is to look and see how much of this totally uniform uh, distribution ends up uniform once you look at where the outflows are. And these are the catchments that you might form out of the network. And of course, these are not uniform. That's entirely to do with mesh, mesh discretization. If you introduce taking two neighbors or three neighbors, then this kind of eliminates some of the effect of the sort of mesh which is, I think, a good thing. Another thing that you obviously need to do is if you just take a, a DEM and randomly do this process to that, uh, is that there's a discretization error associated with sampling that if you don't sample the center of the point, then you'll find high points. You might sample on the side in one place and base somewhere else. And so there's a, a, the, the, the flow paths across the surface are very artificially interrupted. Um, particularly in this case, this is a model that's just a couple of kilometers in scale. And so um, most of it is, <clears throat> there's a lot of statistical stuff in there. Um, but um, but, but that, that means that we need some, appro some approach to saying, well, there are in here some lakes and places where actually the original, original uh, flat, the original surface is not really where the flow paths go. So 
Um, he, here I took a nice smooth landscape and tipped tip the, uh, the shotgun to it, blasted a load of holes into it, or uh, <coughs> pits into it, and then um, ran an algorithm over this in which we, we used that catchment detection flood filling process of um, reverse, reversing the flow pathway uh, using the matrices to, to, to detect where the uh, spillways are, I suppose, for each of these pits, and then just fill them in. That's in the smooth process as well. Um, and, and that's what we get. That's what these holes are. If you rain over there, here's a slightly simpler example to follow, but it shows that it works in parallel because here's a sort of egg box that's tilted, and um, and then all of these sort of dark patches and light patches are the parallel domains. And then we apply that filling algorithm, which is essentially agnostic about the parallelism, and uh, we get obtain something that looks like that. So. Waffle, waffle filling algorithm. I don't know if you want to think about that too. I don't think we do it. We can apply that to that landscape I just showed you, which is Port Macquarie, if anyone's interested. And um, <clears throat> and this is the sort of the small changes in height that are needed to correct the uh, the landscape. Oh, I won't say correct it, but it, but uh, to de develop where the pathways should be. So in other words, if if we take the raw um, landscape and start Filling it up to find out where what, what which pieces would fill given the um, space conditions that we're doing this model, right? Which is not which is not to say that there's something that needs doing to it. It's just to talk about the the if you want to do some analysis, you first have to do some pre-processing. So the pathways are then redeveloped, and you can look on Google Earth and see which ones are actually real and which bits of this are kind of something else. This is a piece of you know forest that's just been cleared out there, which is see something else in the problem, doesn't have river damage, but it doesn't show up correctly in the DM. And we can do the same on the very large scale, um, just looking at the river systems. And Well, they're not, sorry, they're not river systems, these are the flow paths. In, in Australia, most of these don't connect up because there's dry, barren spots which don't get any rain to make these sort of connect, connections occur. And in fact, over here, of course, it really does get stuck, it can't find its way out at all. So, um, so we implemented all of this. Uh, I mean, you can try this. Uh, so we called it Quagmire for no particular reason, but uh, it seems like it's uh, we need to fill in a swamp and what's not going to be most appropriate. Um, so it's Python based, but it's based also on PepC and PepC for Pi. So it makes it um, reasonably fast. I would say it's still it's not optimized reasonably fast, but it's parallel fast, right? And parallelism is more or less trivial. Um, so the Pepsi aficionados that we use, um, we use the, the sort of appropriate data managing structures within Pepsi, which gives us a whole bunch of interesting stuff. Um, we also had to go back and build a bunch of meshing classes for this, which we proposed as well. So you can go and play with those. If I, actually, if you're interested in doing triangulation on this here, Bunch of Python code for doing this, so if we think about where we might go with this uh, in the long run, um, and uh, yeah, parallelism, and, and and as you can see, it's it's implemented mostly in terms of operators, which I'll do a lot of work on. For those of you who like working in Jupyter notebooks, that's probably where you just already use this code, so you can run it in the notebooks. For parallelism, that's probably not really enough, but you can just export a Python script. Maybe take out some of the interactive parts, and then um, you can run it with MPI run. Uh, the interactivity, though, is quite nice because a lot of these kinds of algorithms, they do. I mean, you, you, they're not supposed to be um, bulletproof. You just play with them, and you do what you want to do, and you're pre-processing for something. But we want to have a look and see what you're doing. Right? So the interactivity is kind of useful, but the scripting is also there for doing very large-scale things. So the philosophy is, is very similar to that for Underworld. Um, we, converted, uh, we converted Underworld to be very similar to this with a very big bag of um, relatively efficiently implemented Python classes that you can throw together to do whatever you want. Maybe not whatever you want, but within the limitations of the things that we provide, you, you do it. We give some examples to make that work. And the idea is that the science questions then dictate what the codes do rather than the other way around. Which is, uh, which is what we've been trying to do in the tectonic side much more than 
um, you know, much more than the other way around. You don't really want to be doing certain problems just because that's what the code does. Right? So we make the code very, very flexible. The disadvantage of that is that of course you can you can do whatever you want with it because all the stuff is not very interesting. Uh, so anybody in the community then can define their vision, their vision, their version of the problem, and and this code would support that choice. Of course, it's open source. Uh, hopefully an open community as well. Um, we leverage as much as possible on things like PETC um, and produces a, there's a strategy then for you to interoperate with other Python code. And installation uh, would be through PIP or SPAC or one of those kinds of package managers. Um, I haven't uploaded the code for you to do that yet, but you can, you can see it'll be there fairly soon. It's not shrimp rack wrapped to do anything other than show a few examples. So in that case, it's kind of a typical Python project. Here's a bunch of stuff you can do. And you can do that. Maybe, maybe just people will take it and do some of the algorithms. I don't know. If you want to try, um, then uh, the, the most robust way is to, to go to use the Docker container that is, is currently live, well, and is currently available. Uh, for a limited time only, you can go to this, um, you can go to this URL. And run it. And if you do that, so I've, I was running it on my phone this morning, and some of you I showed you what it was doing. Um, so that's running in the cloud, and you can log in uh, through this port. Um, there's only one machine behind that, so I guess if everyone does that, it won't actually last very long. But you can, I'm more than welcome to try, and I'll restart it if it crashes. Uh, the, it's a GitHub project, so of course you can do it. Um, yeah, so that's. That's, that's where we're at. You can go, if you go into this URL, you'll see sort of a front page like this, which is really just a kind of a nice landing point after which you go into this and don't look for anything back. So, I don't know, you may, you may find it valuable, but it's there, it's there to look at. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Louis. <laughs> we have time for questions. Boris Kovacs, University of Mainz. Thank you very much for a very cool talk. And I just want to reiterate for the people in the audience that don't quite catch that. The major problem for doing lithospheric scale models, essentially we must use MPI parallel loads. There's no way to do 3D without this. And this has been the main hampering of coupling these kind of codes because Almost all landscape evolution models have been running either on a shared uh, memory machine or on one processor. So I think what you are showing here is an absolutely crucial step in making progress. So I do have a few more remarks regarding the, you, you were showing uh, that you implemented the matrix form and also the graph form. What is more efficient for which? Um, I think I think it probably depends because the matrix form is, is uh, not well optimized for any particular problem. So I think if you use the graph algorithm, um, you, you can look at all the special cases and really optimize it correctly for that. And, um, and I haven't done anything else. In fact, I mean the, the one optimization you can do actually is to sort of pre-multiply a bunch of the build sort of uh, multiple tensile and combine them so you can multiple operate them at once. So you can sort of optimize a little bit. Um, but basically uh, I, I would get my guess would be that you would have a more clear tree. That uh, that's the case that it really is about it really does open it up to parallel loads and stuff more than just the matrix form. Uh, so that's my guess. And the second question would be you were showing a little bit about the mesh sensitivity, and we haven't heard very much about that for the last few days, surprisingly. But mesh sensitivity is kind of a big issue in the landscape evolution models, at least in my experience. So does that get rid of it by connecting it to two or three neighbors? Um, well, um, I, I guess what you see is what you get in both those cases, right? If you, if you lose that information, the other thing that you can look at, the other mesh sensitivity that I would actually stress here, but it's sort of ob an obvious one, is that if you're doing something like this where you do some pre-processing, or 
the other part of the mesh, let's see, I can probably use mesh one, mesh twice, and there's some randomness to it, then you might get a different result. But this particular example is poorly, poorly chosen example because it's not just one channel up and down. And there's multiple channels that we connect. So depending on how you try to you know, try to mesh this, sometimes the mesh will flow away one way and sometimes the mesh will flow away the other way. So all of these things could be parameterized as multiple channels in the sense that in one mesh they exist in one mesh and in the other mesh they exist in a different mesh. So there's a mesh that exists in the protein chain and there's a mesh that exists in the DNA chain. And it would not be about multiple paths representing different paths across the same mesh, but multiple paths, multiple paths across multiple meshing instances. So I think you could you, you could certainly construct different you could certainly for a given problem you could certainly say that this is particularly plagued by this particular DNA chain and there's some somewhere around it and I don't say that this is one mesh and this is divided by this mesh and that mesh is divided by this mesh. Thanks for the very cool talk. Um, by um, interoperability with the underworld, do you mean you can truly do um, two-way interaction or that Quagmire just weeds in the underworld as uh, Yeah, so what we had in mind, uh, so for this at the moment, um, the only impediment, I guess, to simply firing the two things up within the same Petsy environment is that the underworld Petsy environment is out of date. It dates back a few years when this was not quite so straightforward. Um, but you should, in principle, be able to use the same collection of processes and, and distribute across so that your data sharing is done across just the surface process of the, the processes which are computing the surface of underworld, right? Um, but I, on the other hand, it's, I mean, I don't know if that's, that, that equally may not be the most efficient way to do it. Maybe if you just do it on, you know, on the same machine, you need to talk through some other mechanism. I'm not really, I'm not really sure about that part of the problem in terms of effective implementation. It just made it so that the two Python codes that can essentially talk to each other through NumPy. Hi, uh, Rolf Alto. Um, that was a very interesting talk. Thanks very much. Um, quick question: You provided some great examples of uh, how Australia, uh, Australian rivers don't necessarily follow steepest descent flow. And uh, you made some comments about the model stability using steepest descent. I was a little unclear on whether or not this code is uh, steepest descent or multiple multiple directions. It's both. So that was the point. You can you can construct. Actually, I mean, it's it, by default it uh, constructs it constructs the first two descent directions. But your choice of which one it's your choice of which one you should use. The reason I have two directions is for the filling algorithm. That it's much more straightforward if you have two neighbors to know when you're a saddle point. So to find to find when you're straddling to when you're when you're straddling a sort of a ridge, the easiest way is to find out if your two two or two of your directions fall into um, different catchments, essentially. And that's sort of how the process is actually working. So it, it constructs both. It's your choice of whether you use two or one or two or more in these circumstances. Just briefly coming back to Boris's question partially, given that the, the catchment areas will change, you're going to have to reassemble this D matrix all the time. And can you exploit parallelism for that in a very straightforward way? Um, so the catchments are not, not, D doesn't contain explicitly what that information is. So if you want to know what the catchment information is, you go backwards from the output points. So it's a formal construction to calculate what they are. So the D matrix, you do, you build it on the fly. Um, so you do need to build it each time you remesh because it's it's basically a connectivity matrix. It tells you what the connectivity of the mesh is. Um, sorry, the connectivity across the topography is. So if the topography changes, you should change it. Um, so you are always rebuilding it, but it's totally local as long as you've got shadow information that goes as far as your stencil. And of course, you would you would do that, right? So so the shadow information, the stencil is is uh, the nearest neighbors plus a few extras to give you a bit of extra choice to find things within the a lump somewhere. Um, Adina Pusok, uh, SIO UCSD. So actually something related to Torsten's question. So you assembly the matrices on the fly, uh, so it's dynamic assembly. Uh, how does that affect the memory load? Um, we know, 
we, those matrices have a maximum non-zero structure. And so for any given one that we make, we know, we know a priori what the memory allocation is. For, for a given distribution of nodes, across, for a given um, decomposition of the nodes across the system, we know, we know how many non-zeros effectively there are in the matrix maximum, and there'll be a few, a few of those will actually be zero after all, because you'll be at the boundary or something. So in terms of memory allocation, that's already known, and so you just, you're just filling the matrix. Actually, so you pre-allocate all of the memory. It's not pretty efficient. Hi, Alison Anders. I had a question about the pit filling and external drainage. So you force, you have pit filling, but you don't end up with Australia becoming all externally drained. Can you talk about yeah, how that works? There's, there's one, yeah, there's, so the, one, one thing is that it finds lake air. A lot of things work their way down to lake air, which is below sea level. So it just decides that that's one of the places it can go. And then I guess just like the real um, Murray River, it struggles a bit to find a way out without filling it an awful lot. So I, I mean, I just terminated that. I ran it a bunch of times, figured out that there was a, a low point in the system around, uh, I think it's just inland of Adelaide, I guess, and you couldn't find, you didn't find a way out without continually cycling again. But I actually thought that was kind of interesting. I just terminated the process. I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't completely fill right out to the top. So, I mean, I just, I just put in the termination. Um, <clears throat> great talk, Laurie. And uh, I know you and others have been working on this for many, many years. Uh, and I'm really glad to see that you know, it's, it's coming to this. Um, question, you, you use this tree structure um, which others, as you said, have been using also um, to build the flow path and, and the accumulation of flow. But <clears throat> as you may know, we have also used that to solve the, the equations. And it helps because you can actually, in some cases, uh, le it leads to an implicit formulation of, of the uh, integration of the tree. Can you do this here as well? So we, I mean, the thing is I don't build the tree, I build the tree for illustration purposes to make sure they're the same. And that was the last time I did it, right? So, um, I did, I sort of demonstrated it for equivalence. Um, and I think that was my response to Boris's question at the beginning, which was that um, we, I'm guessing though that once you formulate things in the matrix form, there'll be a way to look at it and go, ah, I see how to do this. And the, the, net, the abstraction that you, so that you could work with the, you could work with the full matrix representation and look to see if there's some way to, to uh, speed that up. Um, but, but I guess the, the, the we, we then build it as a virtual matrix, which is the fact that we use the recursion to do an iteration. And that shouldn't necessarily be a problem if you have the right structure. That's what we've been doing in Stokes flow for years, right? We just, we never build the whole, the whole thing that we want. We just leave it as a virtual, as a virtual matrix and, and solve that. Um, so I, I thought about that. There's a lot of, you know, I do think that there are people forward by formulating things in first person matrix form, but I haven't actually. So I figured I would just release this and see if it can reach the right state. And we can take that as a Let's end on that note and thank both of our speakers again. I got one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one more thing. I should say, no one had asked the obvious question, which is what's the path to the password? And um, <laughs> that's good because that means that no one was like sitting there trying to do that. But if you do want to have a if you do want to have a go and write a Instructions to someone to go and have a look at this thing online. Password is first password is quagmire or lowercase dash zero. Feel free to have a go. All right. Thanks a lot, Louis, for making this accessible. And uh, just a reminder, we have the uh, picture coming up. There's the coffee break, and then we have breakout session. And uh, the assignments are in the back. Yes, and please, uh, if you're on the roundtable, please see. Louise, who is in the back.